And now I'd like to Sir Ivor Roberts to continue the case for the proposition. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. It's very nice to be back in this chamber again. The last time I was here, I think, was 1964. <laughs> and I, I have to say the chamber has weathered and aged much better than me. <laughs> no one... No one in their right mind is suggesting that no one should combat terrorism. But a war always has to be against something or on something. It usually involves victory, defeat, or a ceasefire come armistice. A war on terror is different. It's not comparable to a war against Nazi Germany, for instance, or a war on smallpox, or the, war on the, <coughs> or the Cold War. In all these cases, it's possible to measure victory or defeat. But terror is different. The war declared on it post 9-11 gave the impression that the counter-terrorism campaign could result in victory. Mr. Bush's words were quite specific. But a glance at history suggests otherwise, and that terrorism, like the poor, will always be with us. Nor is terrorism a recent phenomenon. Three kings, three presidents, six prime ministers, and 26 other royals, ministers, and other government figures died at terrorist hands in the first dozen years or so of the 20th century. And then, of course, came the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand in 1914, which triggered the Great War. By contrast, the more recent past has seemed quite restrained. In a comparable period, say the decade of the 1960s, the only high-profile assassinations were those of President Kennedy, his brother Bobby, Malcolm X, who famously appeared in this chamber only weeks before his murder in December 1964. I know, I remember, I was here. And Martin Luther King. But the trouble with terrorism is that terrorists don't accept that they're beaten. In the film Gladiator, which one or two of you may have seen, during the battle scenes with the Germanic tribes, the general Quintus says to his superior, the hero of the film, Maximus, a.k.a. Russell Crowe, people should know when they're conquered. To which Maximus responds, would you, Quintus? Would I? To expect a victory in the war on terrorism is a pipe dream. Consider the facts. The declared war on terror in 2001 opened up a huge international campaign with major increases, as we've heard from Rebecca, in military spending in the US and in those countries willing and able to cooperate in the war. While the early years of the war registered some success, notably in the overthrow of the Taliban and the lack of major terrorist attacks on the, UK, on the US mainland post 9-11, the picture grew considerably darker as the war continued. The war in Afghanistan had not eliminated al-Qaeda, but dispersed them, indeed making it more difficult to neutralize them. And their sponsors, the Taliban, have not gone away, as we are reminded almost daily. They launched a full-scale insurgency from 2006 onwards, and it increasingly looks as though they will have forced their way into being future partners in an Afghan government. Great success. And their sister organization, the Pakistan Taliban, formed in 2007, have carried out monstrous acts of terrorism against school children, including the attack on Nobel Prize laureate Malala, now a student at this university. The decision to invade Iraq also diverted huge resources away from prosecuting the war in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, in Iraq, the overthrow of the government of Saddam in 2003 was quickly overshadowed by the incompetent handling of the post-invasion planning and the sectarian tensions which soon evolved into civil war. They also fueled terrorist attacks on the invasion force and indeed on the United Nations. Between 2004 and 2007, the worst period, the estimated number of casualties in Iraq 
overwhelmingly civilian, was put at somewhere between 150 and 250,000 people. On the Allied side, in total, some 4,400 US and some 300 other Allied combat troops have so far lost their lives in Iraq. In Iraq, we also saw the emergence of the unbelievably barbaric and ruthless terrorist branch organization of Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. And this was a direct reaction to the US-led invasion. And as we know, this in turn morphed into ISIS, the caliphate, so-called Islamic State. And anyone who thinks that the defeat of the caliphate on the ground has led to the demise of Islamist jihadis needs a reality check. Returning jihadis from Syria and Iraq will pose a threat on Western streets for years to come. And then there's the moral dimension of the war on terrorism. To start with the widely acknowledged illegality of the invasion of Iraq without an authorizing Security Council resolution, widely acknowledged, that is, except by adamantine interventionists like Tony Blair. Then there's the use of enhanced interrogation as a euphemism for torture, the holding of accused enemy combatants without trial at Guantanamo Bay, the cruel and degrading treatment of prisoners in Abu Ghraib prison, the practice of extraordinary rendition, the abduction and transfer of suspected terrorists to detention and interrogation in countries where international legal safeguards do not apply, the use of unmanned drones to kill suspected terrorists without trial. Together, these have all contributed to making the image of the West and the US in particular in the Muslim world toxic. It is this combination, as much as the invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan themselves, which has spawned the emergence of terrorism on an industrial scale since the war on terrorism was declared. So the war on terror I submit, has not only been self-defeating, it has amplified the message of militant Islam and united disparate groups in a common cause. One way to detoxify the current Western brand in the Middle East and deal a lasting blow to terrorism would be to reboot the Middle East peace process, which has for too many years been stagnant. The prospects in the current climate are anything but good. Both sides seem wholly entrenched in their irreconcilable positions. But we shouldn't forget how close to peace in the Middle East we came with the Oslo Accords in 1993, which aimed at achieving and nearly achieved a peace treaty based on fulfilling the right of Palestinians to self-determination and mutual recognition between the PLO and the State of Israel. We need, perhaps, to revisit the terms that were discussed then as it's clear, as we've also heard, that only a political solution will work. With such a solution, Middle East terrorism would, I believe, decline sharply. Our own experience in the troubles in Northern Ireland demonstrated how a war on the IRA and the IRA's war on the British Army could ultimately only be resolved by a political solution, both sides conceding that no military solution was in sight. The political solution that worked in the Good Friday Agreement of 1998, essentially power sharing, had been on offer 25 years earlier in the so-called Sunningdale Agreement of 1973, so that the Good Friday Agreement was famously described as Sunningdale for slow learners. <laughs> the extra 25 years cost another 3,000 mainly civilian lives while the war continued. Perhaps 20 years, 25 years on, we might be able to find a solution to the Arab-Israel question, which might be described as Oslo for slow learners. If so, we will, I submit, have done more to subjugate, though not eliminate terrorism, than any number of battlefield encounters. Thank you. <laughs>